We did finish section 1.8 yesterday, not, not yesterday, but last class, that was the intro to transformations, the definition of a linear transformation. We are going to keep right on going with linear transformations, though section 1.9 is also um, about those. And in particular, we've made the following observation. Suppose that A is a matrix, then we can use A to create a linear transformation. T of X equals A times X is kind of the prototypical linear transformation. And if A is M by N, then X for this multiplication to be defined has to be N by one. And this is a transformation from R N To Rm. We've seen a linear transformation that, I mean, we haven't actually looked at a lot of examples, but we've seen a linear transformation that seemingly has nothing to do with matrix multiplication. And that was rotation counterclockwise by theta radius. We offered an argument that that was a linear transformation from R2 to R2. It does not on its face have anything to do with matrices, but there's a reason I'm using phrase, phrases by, on its face. Let's present a theorem. That T from R that's N to R M be any linear transformation. Then this linear transformation is secretly matrix vector multiplication. It may not look like it, but there is a matrix A such that T of X is A times X. So every linear transformation from Rn to Rm can be thought of as matrix vector multiplication. And let me just A is M by N, so that this matrix vector product is defined. Let's prove this theorem and let's give some examples of this theorem. The proof, first of all, and we're going to start by defining some elementary vectors E sub I 
is going to be the vector that is one in its ice component, but otherwise is all zeros. So in R sub two, for example, we have E sub one, which is one in its first component, zero everywhere else. And we have E sub two, which is zero in its first component, one everywhere else. In, in R sub three, we have E sub one equals one zero zero. E sub two equals zero one zero. E sub three equals zero zero one. You uh you first see these vectors in calculus three, but they don't get called E sub one, E sub two, E sub three. They get is it I J K? I forget, but they get called something else there. Here, because we want to be able to have vectors of different sizes, we have this notation for them. And these vectors turn out to be super important. Um, and here's where we'll see the reason why. Let's say we have this linear transformation, T of X equals whatever. We have claimed it. that there exists some matrix A such that T of X equals A times X. We'll now go further. I'm going to tell you what A is. A is a bunch of, we'll think of it as a bunch of column vectors sitting next to each other. And the columns of A are this transformation applied to E1. That's our first column. This transformation applied to E2, that's our second column, and then so on down the line. We apply this matrix to this transformation, sorry, to each of the E sub I. We get these vectors, we put the vectors together into a matrix. As a example of that, T will take vectors in R2 and it's going to uh, turn them essentially into numbers. It's going to truncate the second entry and just give us the first entry. Um, 
I guess, formally speaking, we're thinking of that A not as a number, but as a vector in R1. Um, this is a linear T of A, B plus C, D equals T of A plus C B plus D equals, let's just drop the bracket notation for numbers. It's A plus C. And A is what you get if you take this first vector and cut off the second component. So A is T of A, B, and C is T of C, D. So that's the first requirement of linearity. The second requirement is that if we have a scalar times a vector and we hit it with T, no, that's T of alpha A, alpha B. That's alpha A. And that is indeed T of the vector A, B times alpha. So this is a linear transformation from R2 to R1. And according to what I said, then there should exist a matrix A such that P of X equals A times X. And let me see, X is a two by one vector. A should be suddenly Oh, right, this is fine. Just sort of thinking A should be a one by two matrix. And we'll get, I mean, we'll get the dimension of A automatically because if X is two by one, we're in R2 and we only have two of these vectors. We have E1, E2. And when we, so we'll get this two columns automatically. And then the one row that will just come from seeing what T does. We apply T to one, zero, and we get one. Let's remind ourselves that this one is a one by one vector. And we apply T to zero one. 
and we get to zero. So we're trying to create this matrix A. According to our theorem, we should apply it to E sub one, and we should apply T to E sub two. And then once we have these vectors, they are going to form the columns of A. And in this particular case, A is the um, one by two matrix, one is zero. So our claim is that multiplying by A gives us this linear transformation. Well, let's see if we multiply a vector by this matrix capital A, we get we get a one by one matrix in return. This is one by one by two. This is two by one. Multiply them and we do get a one by one vector. And it's one times A, zero times B. This is indeed A. So multiplying by this matrix does do what this linear transformation. I write this example down here. Multiplying by this matrix does do what that linear transformation is supposed to do. So we can think of any linear transformation as matrix vector multiplication. Why is that true? And why do these E1, E2 is coming? to say. Let's give a proof of this, or let's say an argument rather than a formal proof. For simplicity, let's just say that we're going from R to to R2. And T from R2 to R2 is linear. Then let's apply T to a vector. Let's apply T to the vector A, B. The vector A, B can be written as a sum. It's A zero plus zero B. And then he already says, that a linear transformation applied to a sum is the same as applying T to the first vector plus T applied to the second vector. And now we'll use linearity a second time. We'll observe 
that the vector A zero can be rewritten as the scalar A times the vector one zero. And zero B can be rewritten as the scalar B times the vector zero one. Linearity says we can pull these scalars out. And we get this. This is a linear combination of vectors, a scalar times a vector plus a scalar times a vector. And a linear combination of vectors can be rewritten as a matrix times a vector. In particular, the vectors give us the columns of the matrix. So the columns are T of one zero and T of zero one. And these scalars A and B give what we are multiplying by. So this linear transformation, whatever it is, is a matrix times a vector. And of course, this vector one zero is precisely E one. And this vector zero one is precisely E two. So it is the specific matrix that we wanted in this uh, theorem. Could do a few more examples. We don't want to get tedious about this, but maybe a nice example would be the rotation matrix. We made the observation that counterclockwise rotation by theta is linear. Ergo, it should be the same as matrix vector multiplication. Let's take a look here. is the vector E1. Here is the vector E2. Let's rotate both of these matrices by, sorry, let's rotate both of these vectors by theta. So we rotate E1 by theta and we rotate E2 by theta. And making allowances for my always mediocre artwork, 
if we draw a right triangle like this, and we draw a right triangle like this, those right triangles are similar, congruent. High school geometry was long ago. There are two right triangles. They have the same angles and they have the same sides, is what I'm trying to say. And now right triangle trigonometry. E1 had a length of one. We rotate it by theta. It still has a length of one. So this vector, just by the unit circle definition of trig functions, this point is the point cosine theta comma sine theta. And the matrix that corresponds to this matrix vector multiplication is therefore going to be cosine sine. Now, as I say, these using the similarity of the triangles, this and this are the same. That makes and this distance and this distance are the same, but the x coordinate is negative. If we're in the second quadrant, which makes this point the negative sine of theta, comma, the cosine theta. which makes this our matrix. I haven't, by the way, written on the board the name. This is the standard matrix of the linear transformation. And allegedly multiplying by this matrix will take a um, vector and rotate it um, counterclockwise by theta radians. And this is true. I mean, we could select a nice value of theta. We could say theta equals pi over two. And then this matrix becomes zero, one, negative one, zero. And we could, um, pi over two, remember, is 90 degrees. And we can take a vector, say one, one, and we can ask what happens if we multiply this matrix by this vector. And we wind up with negative one, positive one. And if we now look at these vectors, here is the original vector, one, one. Here, is the new vector negative one, one, 
I hope it's obvious from my drawing, but that is a right angle. So this multiplication did take that vector and rotate it counterclockwise by pi over two radians, just like it was supposed to. And you don't have to commit this to memory, but we will come back and use it later in the course. But I'll remind you of it then. Any questions so far? Then. These definitions, let me see, will these definitions be familiar? You've certainly seen one-to-one -one functions when you learn about inverses. A function has an inverse if and only if it passes the horizontal line test and is therefore one-to-one. -one. Let's extract this definition. We've got a transformation from Rn to Rm. This transformation is called one-to-one. If T of V equaling T of W means that actually V and W are two different names for the same vector. So being one to one means that you cannot have a situation where you have two different vectors in Rn and they're both being sent to the same vector in Rm. If you have something like this, your transformation is not one, two, one. And um, let's see. An example of a transformation that is one to one is this rotation transformation. If you have, if you have an image of the rotation transformation, and you want to know its pre-image, you just take the image and rotate it clockwise. And this pre-image is the only vector that you can rotate by theta radians and get to this image. It's one to one. An example of a transformation that is not one to one. We already looked at this, but T of A B equals A. This is a perfectly nice linear transformation from R2 to R1. But for example, the vector one, one and the vector one, two both get sent to the same image. 
image. So you have multiple vectors, multiple pre-images being sent to the same image. It's not one-to-one. -one. So let me see here some space. One to one and on to are traditionally presented at the same time. At the, I mean, in sort of higher level mass classes like linear algebra, it's possible you've never seen on to though. I don't know where this definition is first presented. Maybe here. T is on to if for every vector. W in R M there is a vector V in R N such that T of V equals W. This could be stated more compactly by saying that the range of the transformation equals its codomain. As an example of a might be a kind of weird way to approach a definition. But as an example of a linear transformation that is not on to, we could look at the linear transformation from R2 to R2 that keeps the first component the same, but turns the second component to zero. This is a linear transformation. Let's just accept that it is linear. It's not on to and the reason it's not on to is that for example, the vector one one is not in the range. And the vector one one is not in the range because the transformation turns every second component to zero. So any vector with a non-zero second component is not in the range. So you have this transformation. It's from R2 to R2. But the only parts of R2 that get mapped to by this transformation are vectors with zero as their second component. Any vector with a non zero second component isn't getting mapped to, and it's not on to. Having 
given these definitions, question how do we determine if a linear transformation is one to one. And how do we determine if a linear transformation is on to? Well, we're going to put together some material we've already seen. We'll start by writing the linear transformation in terms of matrix vector multiplication. Remember, we can always do this, even if the transformation isn't initially described in those terms. We can, we can use this theorem to write any linear transformation as a matrix vector product. So saying that it's on to is the same as saying AX equals B always has a solution. And saying that AX equals B always has a solution, I of have an idea that I forgot to say this in class, but you all successfully completed a homework assignment on it. So sorry if I did forget it, but saying that this always has a solution is the same as saying that every row of A has a pivot position. One to one. One to one says that AX equals B can only have one solution. And what are the alternatives? Well, the alternative is that it could have infinite many solutions, and whether it has one solution or infinitely many solutions depends again on the pivots. If every column is a pivot column, there aren't any free variables, and we can only have one solution. So you see a one-to-one -one and on to both depend on the pivots of this matrix A. If every row has a pivot, it's on to, if every column has a pivot, it's one to one. 
And these are therefore sort of related, but sort of unrelated concepts. We can get the theorem from this. Say we have a transformation whose domain and codomain are the same. Then that transformation is on to if and only if it's one to one. And that's because if T is going from Rn to Rn, then A is a square matrix. Like if we're going from R3 to R3, then A is three by three. Well, every column can only have one pivot. Every row can only have one pivot. So the only possible way to put three pivots in a three by three matrix is if those pivots are going down the diagonal. So if it has three pivots, they look like this. Every row has one, every column has one. If it doesn't have three pivots, if it only has two pivots, for example, then there must be a row without a pivot and there must be a column without a pivot. So it can't be one to one or on to in that case. But this is a special property for when the transformation is going from Rn to Rn. Ordinarily, I mean, if A were a rectangular matrix, if A were this, for example, then every row has a pivot, but every column does not have a pivot, which makes it on to, but not one to one. Let's look at an example, a concrete example. This is also going to illustrate something about your calculator that we should be aware of. Let's say that T of X, Y is three X plus Y, 5x plus 7y, x plus 3y. Um, this transformation is linear. The reason I know this transformation is linear without doing a bunch of work is that this transformation corresponds to a vector equation and vector equations correspond to matrix equations. 
This is why we had that homework, rewriting various equations as other types of equations, being able to do stuff like this quickly is going to save a lot of time and hassle throughout the course. So this is a linear. And in fact, we figured out what the matrix of the linear equation was without recourse to the theorem. We didn't need to find T of E1 and T of E2 and put them together. But if we had, we would get that. This is T of E1. This is T of E2. And let's ask if this is one for one. And let's ask if it's on to. Either way, I mean, we're going to, I suppose a certain amount of common sense could prevail here. Um, there can only be as many pivot positions as there are columns, meaning there are at most two pivot positions, meaning that every row cannot have a pivot position. So we actually already know that it isn't on to, but for one to one, that's um, that's take this matrix and let's put it in row echelon form so we can see where the pivot positions are. Let's see, share this so it shows up for in my recording, go to matrix, edit, I have this in my notes, so I'm just going to copy this. Here is A, and we take this matrix, we go to put it in reduced row echelon form, and our calculator spits back an error message. And this is, this is nonsense. Every matrix can be put back, can be put into row echelon form. Every matrix can be put into reduced row echelon form. There's no reason that this $120 piece of equipment should be breaking down because we have more rows than we have columns. But that's what's happening. If you have more rows than columns, your calculator just will not do the elimination. And we can get around that. It's predict this that we should have to, but we'll go into the matrix menu, we'll edit it, and let's just add an extra column. And this column is meaningless. It's completely artificial. We're going to ignore it. We're only putting it here so our dumb calculator will no longer break when we do this. And remember that again, that last column isn't really there. It's a fake 
column that we put in. So our calculator would do this for us. The actual matrix in reduced row echelon form is one, zero, zero, one, zero, zero. And we can see that both the columns do have pivot positions, but one of the rows does not have a pivot position. So going back to the whiteboard, There's a row without a pivot position, so it's not on to, but all the columns have pivot positions, so it is one to one. And that's it for section 1.9. We have about 20 minutes left and we'll keep right on going into section 2.1.